All right, can you hear me? Yeah, what's that? Hey, bro, how you doing? Doing good. Okay, so um, I know the whole baptism thing is the subject right now, but uh, I'm gonna change it up a little bit if that's fine. Um, so up above it says babies aren't born sinful. Is that your belief? I believe babies are born spiritually alive. Okay, so um, you're saying that born babies are not born in sin. They are not sinners at birth, right? Is that what you're saying? Well, being born in sin doesn't mean you're born a sinner. Hold on a moment. I might be muted for a second. Hold on a second. Okay, I see what you mean now. You're saying that spiritually they're not sinful, but they're still born into sin, and that's how they're influenced? Right. We're born into a world of sin that shapes us. And so you see others around you committing sin. We're born into a world where bad things happen, right? It's not a sinless world. We're born into we're born into sin and now we're born into a sinful world. But that in and of itself doesn't make a person a sinner. Like you're not born a sinner just because you're born into a sinful world. Like you can be born in a prison, but not be a prisoner. I see. Um, so have you heard of uh, Pelagianism? Mm -mm. So Pelagianism is the theory that, um, or it's the belief uh, that everyone was born with the same nature as Adam and therefore had a choice to be righteous. Would you agree with that? I think just like Adam and Eve were spiritually alive before they sinned. Because like the Bible talks about uh, being born spiritually alive like you and I. We're born spiritually alive until we attain a knowledge of good and evil like Adam and Eve did. And then we choose to become spiritually dead like Adam and Eve did. So I would say that even though you see a baby and a child might commit something in your eyes that might be wrong, they don't have a knowledge between good and evil. So they're not held accountable for that choice until they reach an age of understanding, which Adam and Eve had. And then they choose for themselves to do something that they know is wrong. And then at that moment, they're held accountable. So in that sense, what you're saying is that technically speaking, we could live a life free from sin. It's possible. Nobody has ever done it except Jesus. So you're saying it's possible. It's possible in a sense. Uh, well, mankind's given free will. So man has the free will to choose that. But no man has ever used free will to choose that. But it's to a point where, I mean, obviously it's impossible for us not to sin because god knows us so well he knows that we will sin and that's why he does say it in the bible that jesus did not sin and no other man had done that because it's the sense of predestination where not so much that we don't have free will and he already chose it it's the fact that he knows us so well he knows what we're going to do and he know he knows that we will sin so what you're saying is that it's possible to not sin it's just that we will sin eventually we're bound to I would agree along those statements, like a person who's been a Christian for 30 years, like they might commit less sin than somebody who has been a Christian for a week. But at the same time, the person who's been a Christian for 30 years, who knows the Bible like the back of their hand still at some points chooses to do something wrong and will need forgiveness for those sins, too. OK, OK. Um, And also, um, I see at the top, it says there's only one church. What do you mean by that? Um, I mean that, geez, well, real quick, do you believe, because I'd like to talk about that, but do you believe babies are born spiritually alive? I haven't really looked too far into it. Um, I always thought we were sinners at birth because um, I have a doctrines class. That's what we learned that we're born in sin, but they never said, they never, they never, less, less, ah, they never necessarily taught that um, we are born sinners, but rather that we are sinners as humans eventually, and we will sin, we're bound to. Right. I hear people say that we're we I hear people say we sin because we are sinners. But if you take that same reasoning, Adam and Eve sinned, but they didn't sin because they were sinners. So it shows that like a lot of the traditional things that people say, like speaking, it doesn't make sense. And like people teach babies are born spiritually dead, but you cannot be dead unless you're first alive. Like that's the definition of death is you have to first be alive. So at some point, even if they say you're born spiritually dead, at some point, you had to be spiritually alive in order to be spiritually dead. Like, that's by definition of dead. I see. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, but, but uh, I'll, I'll answer your question about the one church. But uh, if you have like a note or something, Romans chapter 7 verse 9 is the verse that teaches that we're born spiritually alive.
Okay. Well, I mean, that makes sense because I was going to bring up Psalm 51 5, but that says that we're um, conceived into sin and not necessarily that we're conceived a sinner. Right. So I, I see what you're talking about now. I thought you were trying to say like, babies were like incapable of sinning and the whole age of accountability like mormon thing i'm like what's going on here but uh do you so like jesus in matthew 16 18 he promised to build one church and so he like said i tell you you are peter and upon this rock i will build my church so he promised to build an ecclesia that's a greek word which means a called out people and so um and like Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says that the elders in Ephesus should shepherd the church of God, but it says which he purchased with his own blood. So the idea, though, that there is one church, but there's different geographical locations of that one church throughout the world that all should be teaching the same thing. I see. OK, so what you're trying to say is that there shouldn't be all these branches or like all these denominations. It should just be one like uh yeah but that would cause these people who are in denominations either everybody there would have to convert or they'd have to leave that denomination in order to become a member of the one church i see okay so are you um are you like catholic or orthodox or are you protestant like what do you fall under or what do you consider yourself uh like one of the descriptions is romans sixteen sixteen. it says the churches of christ salute you so i'm just in the geographical location where we meet, we believe we're members of the Church of Christ. So like on the building, on the sign, it says, uh, the Church of Christ meets here. Okay, well, it's like, what I mean by asking you if, if you're Catholic or um, Orthodox, I mean like, do you agree with the whole thing that Mary is the Queen of Heaven and the Mother of God and all that? Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with it either, but... I believe, I believe the Catholic religion is filled with tradition and that there was a religion that existed before the Catholics got off on all their tradition. And like, I believe that there was one church before the Catholic church even was created. And I believe that it's possible to be a member of the original church. And there's no reason to be a member of any other church than the one. I see. Okay. And then, um, uh, the whole women can't be pastors thing. So I was talking about this with some other dude at one point. Um, so do you remember in the book of uh, Leviticus? I mean, is that what you're calling back to that women can't be pastors? No. Okay. So um, what like what's an example of that in the Bible? Because in Ephesians, I think it's Ephesians four is where it uses the term pastors. Like it says that he gave some to be uh, apostles, some prophets, some pastors and teachers. But the word there, pastor, is Latin. They included the Latin translation of it, but it's Latin for shepherd. And so it's a reference to the position of the eldership and the elders. Like there's, I believe, at least five different terms in the Bible reference to the same position under the New Testament. There's shepherd, uh, presbyter, overseer, um, elder, bishop. And if I didn't say pastor already, so like pastor, bishop, elder, presbyter. It's all a reference to the same position. And like, even if you Google, what is a pastor in the Bible? It'll say it's a reference to the position of the eldership. And according to the Bible, to be an elder, you have to be the husband of one wife. So a woman can't be the husband of one wife. So she cannot be a shepherd, which the Latin word for shepherd is pastor. Okay, I, I agree with that. I don't think women should be pastors either. And it's just like a whole, like what the Bible teaches they shouldn't be. But um, it's like, the argument that was brought up to me was um, in Leviticus, it said that people with lazy eye, people with dwarfism, they can't be pastors. And it was also the whole, uh, I forgot the rest, but it was had to do something about lineage. And, it, and then they were talking about how times have changed, so that can't really apply anymore, which should mean that women can also be pastors, which didn't make much sense to me. Yeah, Leviticus 2 is the Old Testament law. So that was before the New Testament church was established. So uh, we can learn from that. Like we could read it and learn from it. But like none of those teachings are binding upon us today because we're not Israelites and we haven't proselytized to the Jewish religion. Yeah, and a lot of people like to bring up the Old Testament with a lot of out of context stuff. Like, for example, they want to bring up how work save us alone which wouldn't make any sense considering the death of christ would mean nothing in that case if that was the current situation 
So people want to say that in the Old Testament, since it says we're saved by works, but in the New Testament, it says we're saved by faith alone. They want to argue that it's a contradiction, but in reality, it's just a change of time. Yeah, I would say they're saved because even before the Old Testament, usually people talk about the Old Testament, but the Old Testament began with Moses. And there's a whole patriarchal time period from Adam until Moses. So do you have from Adam until Moses, everybody was saved by faith who was saved. Everybody from Moses until the New Testament was saved by faith. And everybody from the New Testament forward is still saved by faith. But um when your definition of faith and loan, do you involve in your definition of faith? Do you involve any works at all? Oh, absolutely. Because it's, it's uh, what's it called? It's works through faith because with faith comes works in faith without works is dead faith. Okay. So when you, so, when you're talking about faith, you're including like o obedience. Yeah. And it's like, people want to say, oh, it's faith and works. I'm like, well, if you want to say like, it's faith and you have to do certain things, not necessarily, but you will do works through faith eventually if you have like actual faith and not dead faith. Right on. I appreciate your conversation. Okay. So, so far, this has been very good. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on Acts 2.38 being baptized in order to receive the forgiveness of sins? Um, I believe, so my, my pastor who was baptized, or my, my, yeah, my pastor was Baptist. Um, he believes that it is a personal choice in that um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a requirement to be saved, but um, I forgot, he did a whole class on, uh, in our doctrines class about why it's not a requirement, even though he is Baptist himself, and I think he had a good argument, but I'm not going to lie, I was probably just doodling on my paper, so. <laughs> okay, I used yeah. to symbol, so is that where you go, you meet with the Baptist church? Uh, so our, our church, um, yeah, it's a Baptist church, but I go to a Christian school and the pastor there is Baptist. So, um, and he is the Bible teacher. So he teaches New Testament survey, Old Testament survey, doctrines, worldviews, but we're learning doctrines right now. And I think in New Testament survey, he went over whether baptism was necessary or not. Okay. I used to assemble with the Baptist church for many years. And then, uh, because when I studied the Bible, I found out that the Bible teaches, like how you're saying they told you baptism isn't necessary, but I believe that I could show you from the Bible that it is necessary. But here's the thing, though. Here's just a side question, because I always found this interesting. Uh, do you find it interesting that a person refers to themselves as a Baptist and says baptism isn't required? Don't, wouldn't you find it kind of different if somebody calls himself a believer but says belief isn't required so um i i get what you mean there but um the whole baptism thing the definition doesn't necessarily include the word baptist like baptism like water baptism it's about i, I forgot how to describe it but there's a really good definition there was a denominations video that i watched and it was a very good definition it was something about how it's like a huge faith thing in a lot of the other denominations count works into the whole thing, but we count mostly faith and then works through faith. So we try to push the whole faith thing, but um, it's not just the whole water baptism thing that we're into do it just as much as any other, any other church, but. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me hit the follow button, and I'd like maybe if possible you could follow me back, and maybe we could message, and if I'm live again, maybe you want to join. Yeah, for sure, dude. All right, and then I'd like to uh, know maybe your thoughts uh, next time, because Acts 2.38, maybe if you ask your teacher or something. But oh, Acts yeah, I'll ask him, and I'm sure he has a good answer. He's been a theologian and just overall like studying all aspects of the Bible, basically, okay. his whole life. Oh, so. here's a good one. Here's a good one. Because Ephesians 2, 5 says you're saved by grace the moment you're made alive together with Jesus. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13 teach you're not made alive together with Jesus until you're water baptized. Okay, so um, I have this huge notebook right here. Uh, do you know what soteriology is by chance? Heard of it. Yeah, so soteriology is the um, study of salvation. We have one, two, yeah, two lessons about like the process of salvation, like justification, 
uh, sanctification and glorification, and none of it really includes the steps of baptism. It's just about um, how glorification occurs following death and how our uh, bodies are redeemed and glorified. Sanctification occurs throughout our lives, and um, we are purified, we are holy, we turn to God, we are separated to God. And then justification, which, occur, which occurs at the moment of salvation, which declares us um, righteous. And justification does not make someone righteous, but it simply labels them as righteous. When I justify my actions, I am stating that they are righteous. So the problem is we are not righteous. So how can God call us righteous without living? That's what it says. But it, there's, right. a, there's like a whole bunch of notes on it. So. Okay, well, if you if you could, uh, if you ask them, because I'd like to know their answer, because Ephesians 2, 5 says we're saved by grace the moment we're made alive together with Jesus. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13 teach that we are made alive together with Jesus when we're baptized. All right, bro, well, I'll make sure to ask him next time I see him. Okay, because I the, the, the problem would be is people are teaching you're made alive together with Jesus before baptism, but that can't be the case if the Bible teaches that you're made alive together with Jesus during baptism. I see. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me, but um, usually when something makes sense to me, it makes sense in a whole different way after I talk to him about it because he points out either context or just different verses that explain it more or maybe translation, but... Yeah, and I would just tell you to be aware because, like, you understanding it right now, like, that makes sense to you, that makes sense to me. And what we have to be careful is not letting somebody use intelligence to trick us because if you can, so here's the whole thing. Ephesians 2, 5 says you're saved by grace the moment you're made alive together with Jesus. So if you can pinpoint the exact moment you're made alive together with Jesus, you can pinpoint the exact moment you're saved by grace. And people will say you are saved by grace before being baptized, but that would mean that you're made alive together with Jesus before you're baptized. But the Bible says you're made to got, uh, you're made alive together with Jesus when you're baptized, which means you're not saved by grace and so with Jesus Jesus during baptism. Wait a minute. So I just saw something in the comments that said, "Quick question: If baptism is a must, then how do you explain the thief on the cross going to heaven? Didn't the thief on the cross going to heaven happen before the crucifixion? If I'm not mistaken." Yeah, he was forgiven under the Old Testament. He wasn't saved. Yeah, like that's God. what I was about to say. Is that the if that's a New Testament thing to be baptized, not an Old Testament thing? Well, and he died. He he wasn't alive when Jesus rose the third day. He was dead for three exactly. days. Exactly. We and Jesus after. had to have been risen first and ascended to heaven for him to actually have to have been baptized to be saved. Right. That, that, all the steps had to have already happened for that condition to be. Right. Man, I'm, I'm glad that you saw that. All right. Well, I'll, I'll let you go, and I, I'm looking forward to talking with you again. All right. Later, bro. Have a good night. You too. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.